our starting place. Clay, if you weren't with us Sunday, Hector and Mrs. Hector are expecting a child. Praise the Lord. Keep those babies coming. Amen. Ephesians 6, Colossians chapter 3. Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, and 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're studying the book of Ephesians. We have looked in the last couple of weeks at what the Bible says, ever so briefly in Ephesians, at what the Bible says to husbands, to wives, to parents, to children. Now, now, Ephesians 6, verse 5. Servants. There we go. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respect of persons with him. Colossians 3, don't lose that place. Colossians 3, verse 22. Colossians 3, 22. Servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And then... 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 1, Let as many servants as are under the oak count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to all some words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of the doctrines according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. Father, help us tonight to just set aside all that society has taught us through the years that is incorrect, and to believe all that the Bible says knowing that your word is, is always right. Help us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have two issues we have to address at the outset, or we, we can't even move forward in these verses. First of all, it might come as a surprise to some to see that the Bible gives servants instructions and expects those servants to be obedient to their masters. You would expect the New Testament to have some information as to how to arrange for the overthrow of an existing government, or how to organize and undermine the law of the land so as to make uh, living conditions more suitable to the comfort and well-being of all citizens, and yet such is never endorsed or even addressed in all the New Testament. Jesus Christ, in the three and a half years of His public ministry, in the 33 and one half years of His life, spoke not a single verse of Scripture directing the overthrow of the government or the powers that be. He was concerned with the souls of men. I would say to you that we have a difficult time in America because all that we know about servants and masters is a window of time during which white men enslaved black men and black women 
a time that by the grace of God ended so long ago that uh, it's probably come as a surprise to those of you that watch Hollywood movies and go to public school. It might surprise you to know that that's over. But it is. You also should know that in the New England colonies for long before uh, blacks were brought over from Africa to serve as slaves, that whites were brought over from Europe to serve as slaves. To this day, uh, Orientals enslave other Orientals and uh, Caucasians enslave other Caucasians and, and Africans enslave other Africans. There is slavery the world over tonight as there has been slavery the world over since man fell into sin. When Jesus Christ returns, there'll be no slavery. For, so obviously that's not His will. When Jesus Christ returns, there'll be no such thing as men owning other men as their property and their possessions. So obviously that's not the will of God. But there are a million things in our world that are not the will of God that, that the church cannot solve in the brief window of time and opportunity that we have to solve the world's problems. And so the Lord says to a man who is born into a family of slaves, or a man who is sold into slavery or captured in war and made a slave as an adult, it says to that man, if you are a Christian, your first responsibility is to win your fellow slaves and those who hold you as a slave to saving faith in Jesus Christ. For eternity is much longer than time. And the way you are going to win others to Jesus Christ is to do what you are given to do to the very best of your ability with a right heart and, and to keep in mind that you are not serving some cruel master or some righteous master but you are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I get up in the morning to do whatever it is I'm assigned to do, I am doing that for Jesus' sake in hopes that I can accomplish the conversion, the salvation of some precious soul for Jesus' sake, which would be the best thing I could ever do with my life. Now, I say that with a full and complete understanding that had I been born into slavery, I would most certainly be looking for any way I could to get out of it. I understand. I'm not trying to be a hypocrite. I'm not trying to be unreasonable. I'm telling you the natural tendency in, in every human heart is to be free of the control of any other man. Whether he's your slave owner or your commanding officer or your dad, the desire of the human heart is nobody's going to tell me what to do. And yet... There'll never be a time in this life or the life to come when somebody's not telling you what to do. So one day when I get to heaven, you get to heaven, the glimpse we have of heaven, somebody says, let all fall down and worship him, and everybody does what they're told. And they fall down and worship him. So even in heaven, you're not going to do your own thing. You're going to do God's will. Now, the application carries over to voluntary servitude as well as involuntary servitude. When a man, and I, you have to explain this in America today because, again, Hollywood, news media, uh, public school education has left us woefully ignorant of the basic facts of life. When a man takes what money he has, what skill set he has, what future he has, and mortgages that for the purpose of opening some sort of business. The reason he did that was so that he could turn his $1,000 into $2,000 in hopes of providing a better life for his wife and for his children. In order to do that, he needs some help. So he offers you the opportunity to help him make an extra $1,000 and in return, you can make an extra hundred dollars. So I think I ought to make as much as the factory owner. I think I ought to make as much as the owner of the team. I think I ought to make as much as, well, you may think that, but you don't have as much invested as he does. Though in our country, you are free to start your business. Praise the Lord for that. 
But when, when a man has risked his all to start a business and you come to his place of business and say, I would like a job working for you. The reason you came to his business and asked for a job working for him is because he has more money than you have. If he didn't have more money than you have, he couldn't give you a job. He couldn't pay you anything. So if the day after you and your three high school dropout buddies get a job, you want to begin to cripple his business because he has more than you and that's not fair, you're never going to have as much as he does by virtue of that very mindset and attitude that you have exhibited. So the only option is to take what he has and give it to you and now he can't give you a job because... He's down there in poverty with you. So here's the idea. If the only skill you have is frying slices of potatoes, if someone is willing to pay you money to do that, you get there at seven if he says seven. You wear a smock, an ill-fitting smock if he says wear an ill-fitting smock. You fry them with a smile For the exact number of minutes he said to fry them, you put the exact amount of salt on them that he said to put on them, and you put them in the under the right heat lamp, and you do that with a smile, and at the end of the week when he gives you the thirty dollars a day he agreed to give you, you thank him for it because he kept his end of the bargain. That's how it works. Now, if you don't like that, you can do what he did. You can get some skill beyond frying slices of potatoes. And then you can convince someone to either loan you enough money or or take collateral that you brought to the table. And you can start a business. And you can offer to pay people who have less than you do in skill and desire and energy and risk a job working for you. Here's the idea. He makes a lot because he put a lot in. You make a little because you put a little in. That's how it works. The Bible says when you get to that, when when somebody gives you a job, they are not giving you the company. It's not your company. It's his company. He's giving you the opportunity to, to contribute to his profits. And in return, he contributes to your profits. And if you don't think he's contributing enough to your profits, you can take your skill set and go from, you can move laterally from Burger King to McDonald's or laterally from McDonald's to Wendy's and just, you know, see if you can do better. But that's how it works. Now, somewhere along the way, an atheist by the name of Karl Marx, see, no Bible, he decided that the only thing that was fair and the only thing that was right is look around and see anybody that had anything and take it from them and give it to the people who didn't have anything and then everybody would have the same amount and we'd all be happy. Now, the only problem with communism is you're never going to have a voluntary system of communism. Somebody has to run communism. And the people that run communism have always proven to be very capitalistic. They need palaces from which to make sure all the peasants are equal. Right? So, you're you're never going to have what those who reject the Bible are looking for, everybody equal, because when God sets up His kingdom, everybody's not equal. Jesus is on the throne, and everybody bows down to Him. And the people that earned it have bigger rewards than the people that didn't earn them. And the people that serve God faithfully have more in the kingdom than the people who didn't serve God faithfully. And at the judgment seat, he doesn't give everybody a crown for participation. And he doesn't give everybody an equal reward so some don't feel bad about themselves. He gives it to the people who deserved it. Now, there's one other thing that was interesting here in the Timothy passage. 
there's a natural resentment, and natural is the right word because it grows entirely out of the flesh. There is a natural resentment on the part of saved people to be under any type of authority, and strangely, that's multiplied if the authority they're under is another saved person. Now, look at it. He says, uh, verse number 2, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service. Well, you're a Christian. Why do I have to pay for my haircut? I'm a Christian. Because I make my living cutting hair. Yeah, but you're a brother. I just thought a brother was supposed to... Well, your thinking's wrong. <laughs> Is the car fixed? Yeah. What do I owe you? 200 bucks. Oh, you thought he was going to say nothing. You know why? Well, he's a brother. That's how he makes his living. Now, again, watch Karl Marx and communism in the church. That man owns three houses. I don't own one. Why should I have to pay my rent? He's a brother. Doesn't he understand? The Bible says, verse 3, If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words. Verse 4, he's proud knowing nothing. You can't skip out on the meal you ate at the restaurant because you found out the restaurant owner is saved. Well, I just can't believe a Christian's asking me to... Asking you to do what? What you're supposed to do? He had to pay the distributor for the food you ate in his restaurant. He had to pay the waitress to wait on your table because since it was a table full of Christians, she ain't going to get much of a tip. She'll get a tract with a dollar in it. <laughs> you know what? If you're not going to leave a decent tip, don't leave a tract. It's embarrassing. Okay? Now, the guy's still got to pay his insurance. He's still got to pay his light bill. So if all the Christians in town go eat at a restaurant owned by a Christian because they think, I'm not going to have to pay full fare because he's a Christian, he's going out of business. Now look, I know what I'm talking about. Christians resent doing business with other Christians in a righteous fashion. And it's specifically spelled out in the Bible. He doesn't have to give you a free ride just because he's your brother in Christ. Fair enough? Now... It, 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 it also carries over, not into our secular lives, it carries over in our church lives. We want, a, we want a pastor that studies and teaches the Bible. Prays for us and helps us when things come up in our lives. Praise the Lord. We want, we want tracts to give out. We want Bibles to give to friends. We want, I mean, all these things. Praise the Lord. Why should I have to pay for them? There's people in that church make more than I do. Why should I give anything? There's people in that church, I mean, they could finance the whole thing. Why do you, have you seen where they live? And have you seen the kind of cars they drive? Look where I live. What could I drive? That's communism. You have a communist, socialist mindset, and it's not a biblical mindset. You don't have to pay for the tracts. You don't have to pay for the books. Take them and read them. You want a Bible? We'll get you a Bible. You want to go on a youth activity? We'll take you on a youth activity. You want to, go, you want to sit in a building air conditioned in the summer, heat in the winter? It'll be here, praise the Lord, by the grace of God. Somebody will pay for it. But why do some Christians have a mindset that is just so glad to let somebody else pay for it? And has no sense of conviction or desire about wanting to be one of those who contributes instead of one of those who does all the taking. God's not a taker. He's a giver. Jesus Christ wasn't a taker. He was a giver. Now, let's say one more thing. Then we'll get back to these verses. I, I was blessed to be part of... Probably the first generation in the history of the world 
whose parents were able to give them anything and everything they wanted. My, my father got an orange and a pair of new overalls for Christmas on the good years. On the bad years, he got an orange. Now, if all you got in a year from your parents, besides a roof over your head and grits and cornbread, was an orange, you'd be occupying something. <laughs> but when that, when that generation went through the Great Depression, the government said, we'll send you a check, you just sit home and wait for it. No, they didn't. They had to make work for those men because those men would have been ashamed to take money from somebody else if they'd not done any labor to deserve it. And so they built parks where nobody needed to park and they built roads where nobody needed a road and they dug ditches and then filled them in and then dug them again just so that at the end of the day they weren't taking money they didn't earn. Well, if you, if you even suggested that today, you, would, you wouldn't get enough votes to keep a website going. Today, communism, socialism, and it's in our churches, people just expect somebody else to pay their light bill. They just expect somebody else to pay for their groceries. They just expect somebody else to, to, to put them through life. That's not, that's not Bible. The Bible says servants obey, servants serve, servants diligent, servants right attitude, servants as unto the Lord. The work ethic that made this nation great didn't come from pilgrims, that didn't come from deists, it came from the Bible. And as this nation has lost its biblical foundation, it, it's, it has lost its, its sense of honor and dignity when it comes to work. And millions and millions and millions and millions of people in this country have yet to do a single day's work in their life, and they have no intention of ever doing a day's work, and they believe the people who do have jobs are supposed to give up half of what they earned so that person can sit and watch cable TV and not pay their own bills. They, they believe it's supposed to be that way. You say, why? It's not because they're Democrat or Republican. It's not because they're rich or poor. It's because our country has abandoned the Word of God for 40 going on 50 years now, and they're clueless. The Bible says, fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge. And that crowd out there doesn't even know. They don't even know that it's a dishonorable thing to live off somebody else's labors. They don't even know that it's a dishonorable thing to do a half day's work for your boss man when he's paying to do a full day's work. They don't even know. In fact, they brag about it. Brag about how much time they can steal. Brag about how much stuff they can steal. Brag about how, many, how, how much of this and how much of that they can extort until the country the company goes right down the drain. Then the country goes right down the drain and they don't even feel bad about it. You've got a nation, I don't, know how, I don't even know today how many trillion dollars in debt they are, and nobody's ashamed of it. You know why? Because their family's in debt and they're not ashamed of it. And their church is in debt and they're not ashamed of it. They just keep living off other people's work and other people's money. You can't keep doing that forever. Why? It's not biblical, it won't work. Okay, let's, let's take a look here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10. Turn Proverbs chapter 10. So when you get your first job, young man... I hope your daddy trains you well. My dad come home from work on the day that the yard was supposed to be mowed. And he didn't get out of the car and walk in the house. And No, he got out of the car and he walked around the yard. And he would point out to me little narrow strips of grass 
where when the mower passed going north to south and then turned around and went south to north, the two passes didn't quite meet up. So what's the big deal? You know what the big deal was? He was preparing his son to work three and four jobs at one time and get them all done and get the gospel out around the world without a boss, without a board, without somebody looking over his back, without somebody breathing down his neck because he was taught you do it right, you do it all, and you don't stop until it's finished. I thank God for that. Now. Then it was completely absurd. Who cares if there's a strip? Who cares if you edge three sides of the house? You didn't edge the fourth side. Nobody goes back there anyway. You better not tell him that. Nobody goes back there. I just did. That's all that matters. Amen. So I don't know why I have to make my bed. I'm just going to... I've never understood that either. The only thing that's going to be done with it is you're going to take the covers, pull them back in, get in there again. So what's the big deal about making a bed? It wasn't a big deal about making a bed. It was a big deal about getting the sermon ready. It was a big deal about making the visits. It was a big deal about following up on this. It was a big deal about being able to build a church, hold a church together, get the gospel out around the world. You say, how is that done? You say talent, maybe, ability, maybe, but not without the discipline required to do the work for the work's sake. Say, where'd you learn that? Making a bed. Where'd you learn that? Doing homework. I'm going to do this math. I'm not going to be a mathematician. No, you're not going to be anything if you don't learn to do what you don't like to do because you're supposed to do it. That's why you're doing the math. You want know an employer says you got a high school diploma? Because he wants to know if you can at least show up. Can you at least sit there without disrupting, without without creating some chaos? Can you at least pretend you're doing your social studies so you can get the grade you didn't earn. Can you can at least do that much? So that's where we are. Well, I'm entitled to a job. Why? Because you got more tattoos than the last kid was in here? Why? Because you can skateboard? You're not entitled to anything. Proverbs 10 says this. You ready? I came here for some preaching. This is this is preaching. Amen. This is right out of the Bible. Proverbs 10, verse 4. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So I don't know. Those, those big words. I don't understand what they mean. Here's what it means. If you're lazy... If you're a loafer, if every corner is is calling out to you saying, cut me, you're going to end up in a poorhouse. You don't have to work to get to the bottom. You do have to work to keep from hitting the bottom. And the, the amount of diligence that you will apply to it, look, it's, it's real simple. It's real simple. Time plus Effort equals result. It's just that simple. Two men with the same ability, the one who puts the most time in is going to come out on top. Two men with the same talent, the one that, that gives it the most effort is going to come out on top. You know why some people learn the Bible, some people don't? Time plus effort. You know why some people amount to something for God and some people don't? Time plus effort. You know why some people help build a great church and some people just show up when they feel like it? Time plus effort. You know who you want to hire? Time plus effort. You know who you want working for you in your company? Time plus effort. The guy that clocks on and 10 minutes after he clocks on, he's, he's counting down till he can clock off. Well, I've been here 30 minutes. I don't want to get a smoke break. 
Yeah, you do. When work's over. I don't believe Jesus was lazy. I don't believe Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, I don't believe they were lazy. I don't believe the gospel got spread abroad in the days of the early church because people were lazy. I had a man one time attend this church for years. He sat with me in my office and he said, uh, he said uh, I said, well, so what do you want? He said, well, uh, what I want, I want to be on staff here as assistant pastor. What he said. I said, give me, give me the main reason why you want to do that. He said, I just think it'd be so much fun to go to lunch and sit and drink coffee with other pastors and talk about the Lord. Sure would. Sure would. Imagine saying that. That's your number one reason for wanting a job is so you don't have to do anything? Where do people get that? Hollywood, public school, Karl Marx. Not from the Bible. Not from the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Next book over. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Now it's in me. I thank the Lord. Some of its personality you're born with. Some of its training and upbringing. Some of its Bible and the fear of God. My sisters used to laugh at me. We'd play a board game. I'd grit my teeth when I rolled the dice. So what are you so intense for? It's what I'm doing right now. That makes it the most important thing in the world. I'm not going to play checkers just for the fun of playing checkers. I'm going to beat you. I don't play chess because I can't beat anybody. Don't like it. Anyway, Ecclesiastes 9 says this. Ecclesiastes 9 verse number 10. What shall thy hand find to do? Do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Your Lord said, if you're not going to be busy doing something, you might as well be dead. What's the difference between a man in a coffin or a man lying immobile on a couch? Other than... Every so often, the guy on the couch can use his thumb to click the remote. What's the point? They're both just taking up space. Neither one of them's accomplished anything for God or for man. He gave you a brain. He gave you legs. He gave you arms. He gave you talent. He gave you ability. He gave you time. He gave you opportunity. Do something more than imitate a dead man. Find something to do and do it with all your might. Diligence, hard work, Ecclesiastes 10, right next, next page over, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 18. By much slothfulness, the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands, the house droppeth through. Okay, there's another guy who came along right after Karl Marx. The pit opened up, bottomless pit opened up, out came Karl Marx. Right behind him came Charles Darwin. Here's what Charles Darwin taught. If you don't maintain your 2,000 square foot one story house, in 10 years it'll be a 4,000 square foot two story house. That's what he taught. He said, well, he didn't talk about houses. Well, he, that's his theory. Random chance, accident, selective mutation, things are going to improve and get better over time. You say, uh, you believe in creation or evolution? You have a house? Are the shingles turning from cheap fabric into tile? Or are they falling off and wearing thin? Do you have a house? Is the paint on the wall in the children's bedroom by the light switch brighter and shinier than it was the day you moved in? Or is it showing lots of little handprints? 
How can anybody believe in evolution? There's only one reason. They want a substitute for God. And when they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now here's what the Bible says. If you're too lazy to fix what's broken, it's going to crumble into nothing. If you're too lazy to maintain what God gave you, it's all going to fall apart. It's not going to take care of itself. It's not going to repair itself. And Ecclesiastes didn't say the neighborhood was supposed to come and fix your house. If you don't fix your house, your house is going to fall down and nobody's supposed to build you another one. That's what he said. Now, He's not just talking about a house. You got a business? You think you can get lazy and lose your diligence and lose your zeal and that business not fail? You got a job? You think you can get slack and careless and indifferent and mouthy and keep that job? Come on. It's not enough to have something. You got to maintain it. You've got to maintain that job and maintain that skill set and, and maintain that ability as long as you can. Bible. Bible. A saved man ought to be the hardest working man on his job. A saved woman ought to be the hardest working woman in her neighborhood. A Bible-believing church ought to outwork every carnal, worldly, social church in a town. Say, why? It's the right thing to do. Right by God. Look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. First Corinthians 7. First Corinthians 7, verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. You are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now look, here's, here's the reality of the situation. Thousands of people around the world today, who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the last 2,000 years, have been saved by the grace of God. They've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they are slaves. And the Lord said, you know what? That's probably not getting fixed in your lifetime. Now, are you going to refuse to serve me because you've got a bad lot in life? Or will you use the life I gave you as awful as it is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? That's what he said. Look, if you've got a crummy job, it is, it is human nature to desire a better job. And the Lord said, if you can get one, get it. If you work in, in deplorable conditions and you've got an opportunity to move up and work in better conditions, the Lord said, nothing wrong with that. If you can do it, do it. But where you are, while you're there... Stop living in a world of either daydreaming about how you wish you had what somebody else has or resenting those that have what you don't have and get up every day and use your day for Jesus. That's, that's the objective. That's the desire. He said, he said are, you, are you a servant? Did you get saved? Then use it. Use it. We got school teachers here. So, ah, public school. Well, okay, fine. We got school teachers here. 
Glad we do. I can't go in there and be a witness for Jesus Christ in that high school. So God says, I want you to use your position. Be a witness for Jesus Christ. I can make brief, limited visits to hospital rooms. Some of you work in hospitals. Hurting people, sick people, scared people. You know what the Lord said? If you're a nurse, stop moping around wishing you were a doctor. Use it. Use it. Win that person to Jesus Christ. Well, if you get a better education, get one. If you can move up, improve your job skills, do it. If you can, if you, can you know, uh, climb the ladder to success in your company, that's what he said. There's nothing wrong with that. If you can be free, get free. If you can get a better spot, get a better spot. But you're not going to get it this afternoon. So don't rip off the boss. Don't call in sick when you're not sick. Go in there, work your best, be a good testimony, and win somebody to Jesus. Everybody did that? We're doing okay. I guarantee you, you're happier witnessing and making this much than you are serving the flesh and making that much. If your heart, listen, if your heart's not finding contentment in serving Jesus, there's no job in the world going to satisfy you. Not a one. Our happiness is in Jesus Christ. And the real, the real overflowing of that happiness comes when you're witnessing to others and serving the Lord. Now, let's go back to our context in Ephesians chapter 5. The Ephesians 6 passage we read to start the night said, Not with eye servants as men pleasers. I want to say this real carefully because we all got it in us. I want to say this real carefully because I, 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 I. We have a church here where there was no church. Because somebody did the work that had to be done, not just when they were being watched for show, but round the clock for God. We have books that are being used to train people around the world. We have recorded materials that will, you know, I mean, there's, there's enough there now to keep anybody on earth occupied for a lifetime. Why? Because somebody was willing to work outside the windows where someone was watching him work. You are, a, in the context, husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Parents, fathers, raise up the children. Children, obey your parents. Let me tell you something. You're a sorry husband. If you're only being the husband God told you to be when your wife is watching you. You're a good for nothing wife if you're only a virtuous woman when your husband is seeing what you're doing. You are not a faithful child if you only obey the rules and do the work when mom or dad is standing over you threatening you with execution. And you're not much of a parent if you're one kind of parent in here to show off and you're another kind of parent in the car and in your home when the church people aren't watching you. In the context, what God wants us... Let me say it. In the context, God doesn't want us acting right because that stops when we leave the stage. He wants us being right. And if you'll learn to work in the biblical way for God from your heart, nobody has to watch you, nobody has to check up on you, nobody has to follow you around, you will get the happy as the man that could find enough people to fill the spots in his business that will work like they're supposed to without three layers of supervisors watching them. And happy is the man who can find three layers of supervisors that haven't conspired together to rip off the company. 
It's unbelievable. The waste, the, the stealing, the purloining. That's a good Bible word. That's not working when you're on the clock. That goes on in this country. Christians ought not to be that way. One day, I, I was I stopped at the uh, was on the corner of Orange and Nova, over in Daytona Beach. There used to be a little convenience store there across the police station. And what I did um, first seven eight years, I was at the post office. They have a thing called a T six, and since it's six days of delivery, a man have a delivery route. He'd work five days a week, and then a T six would work five different routes on that man's day off one day. One day a week. And that's that's what I did. And I was in there one day. It was lunchtime. I was in there having something to drink. And this fellow came in whose mail route I delivered once a week. And he pushed me back in the corner and he pulled out a knife. And he said, if you don't quit running my route so hard, I'm going to cut you and leave you to die. Because see, when I did the job the way it was supposed to be done... It showed how he was doing the job. And he wasn't doing the job the way it was supposed to be done. I had all kind of incidents like that in my career working in the secular world. I know what I'm talking about. People don't, you get that job, they don't want you working any harder than they are. They don't want you doing any more than they're doing. God, God said, I want you to do your best for me. Not with eye service as men pleasers. Not not just showing off for the boss man when he's around and not slacking because the other workers don't want you showing them up. Whatever you, your hand finds do, you do it diligently. All your might is unto the Lord. Listen, a hard-working dad, a dad works hard at being a dad, he'll be a better dad than a man that's lazy. It is, it is daddy work. A woman works hard at being a wife, being a mother, she'll be a better wife and mother. Somebody's lazy and indifferent. Just how it is. A church full of people who work hard for Jesus will be a better church than a church full of, full of lazy loafers there for a light show and, a, and a, some entertainment. Just how it is. So, Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, right back where we started. Ephesians 6, servants, verse 5, be obedient. Them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with thy servants men pleasers, but the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord, and not to men. Knowing what serve a good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now, if you believe that, and I do, I just, just believe the Bible. If you believe that, I'm not talking about magic, hocus pocus, karma, anything like that. God said, I will reward you if you obey me. Isn't that what he said? So let's say you work as hard as you can and you never earn the income you desire. Cannot your God... Make your car last five years longer than it should have. Cannot your God keep your furnace and your stove working years longer than it should have? Cannot your God keep you in good health and keep you out of trouble that sin brings? Listen, there's more to this thing than the number of zeros on your paycheck. There's a God in heaven. Habakkuk talks about people whose hearts aren't right with God and they earn wages and put them in a bag full of holes. And the money they make just disappears. I'm telling you, God, God put, put meal in that widow's barrel and oil in that widow's cruise and her food went a lot farther than anybody thought it would because she did right by God. Everybody thinks, well, if I cheat here and I skimp there and I cut this corner, I don't pay that man what I owe him, that I'll, that'll help me get ahead. You left God out. If you do right, God, God will help you. And if you don't do right, you're on your own. 
I just believe that. I'm not saying God, God sends repair bills or judgments and all that, but I'm telling you, this life can be mighty expensive. Or it can run pretty smooth. And the Lord said, I'll take care of you if you'll work hard and do things my way. I just trust him. I'm just going to believe him. I'm just going to take his word for it. Try to pay my bills, pay as a go, live modestly, live humbly, don't, ha- don't have a covetous heart and desire a lot of things in this world. And you'd be, you'd be surprised how much farther a little bit of money goes if you don't have a life and a heart full of lust and right. desire. You'd be content with such things as you have. You don't need to go out and buy something every week to try to make you happy. So, I'd encourage you, work as hard as you can on that job. Amen. Obey the rules to the best of your ability. You've got a business, set the tone. And brother, sister, stop, stop abusing people because they're saved. And you can count on them taking it because God commanded them to be gracious and kind to you. That don't make it right. And somewhere down the road, God's going to bless that man for doing right, and what you've done to that man going to catch up with you. Just, just not a, not a good way to live. I, I'm glad. Now I know people. There's this little window where they lie about you when they leave a church, and some people their windows bigger than others. But, but for the most part, I'm really glad that I've been able to live in a town for 25 years. And the worst thing any businessman in this town's got to say about me is I preach too loud in public places. That's a lot better than having two dozen of them say, I never paid for what I bought at their store. That's a lot better than a bunch of them saying, whatever you do, don't ever hire somebody that goes to that church. They don't work. I'm glad the chief of police and the city attorney and the, and all, all these people. I'm glad they say, I, I, I listen. If we get a if we get a bad call and bad report, we know it either wasn't Bible Baptist Church or the person calling isn't telling the truth. That's how it's supposed to be. Do your best. Do your best at all times for God, and God will bless it. He's proven that in my life, and I thank Him for it.